Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. I've been to gatherings and dinner parties at friends' places, and they've been in everything from, you know, cramped, crappy apartments to fixer-upper houses where the handrail to climb up the stairs to get to the half-finished bathroom is kind of sketched, and the lights don't work either, so you just gotta take it slow. But it's always interesting to see how little it actually takes to turn a house into a home. All you need, really, is some good food and good people. In a bit, we'll talk to one of the masters of the former, Jacques Pepin. But first, the singer Linda Ronstadt recently talked to NPR Scott Simon about her memoir, Feels Like Home, which is part love letter to the Mexican-American border and part recipe book. And in this interview, she offers one magical piece of advice. Get to know your neighbors. You know, odds are they're good people. Linda Ronstadt's Feel Like Home is an album of loves. But the high desert of Sonora and her hometown of Tucson, shown through photos by Bill Steen, pages of her own recollections of family and friends, and even, or maybe that's especially, recipes that bring family and friends together with echoes of each other. Just one of her 38 best-selling singles over a career that encompasses 24 albums, Grammy Awards, honors, and big-time collaborators. Feel Like Home is written in collaboration with Lawrence Downs. And Linda Ronstadt joins us now. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I am dazzled by your description of what the sun feels like in Sonora. Feels like needles. Just really bores into you, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, penetration your bones. So does the cold. People don't realize how cold it is in the desert. People get hypothermia all the time. Uh, the migrants that are walking through the desert, that's, that's a brutal march. You can get all four seasons in one day, I guess. You can. <laughs> I, I've gone into a movie, and the sun was shining brightly, and come out, and the temperature dropped 23, 30 points, and you're freezing to death, and you didn't bring a jacket because it was hot when you left. Yeah. Tell us about your all-day family picnics. That was one of my favorite things to do. Somebody finds a good site on, on somebody's ranch or out in the country somewhere. And you make a mesquite fire and put a grill on it. And there's conversation that goes on and cracks about the food. And then somebody gets out a guitar. They start playing a little bit. Pretty soon they're singing a song we know and everybody starts to harmonize. And it's not a performance. It's not like being on stage, just being there in the room or in the under the trees with good food and good friends. When we were kids, we we didn't have to be sent off to bed. My dad would start to sing, and we know we were up for another good hour. <laughs> we, usually fell, we usually fell asleep on someone's lap, but my dad had a beautiful voice. Yeah. You learned so much about your family here. Could I get you to talk about your family? What I'll call a mixed family, European family that married into Mexico, settled in Arizona. Well, when they first got there, they, they, they settled in in Mexico, but Arizona was Mexico then too. Yeah. And became Mexican by virtue of politics, and the border moved. So we all say we didn't move, the border moved. Mm. You, you talk about when you were growing up, people could cross the border, go back and forth pretty easily. We used to go down for lunch. It just it was friendly. People knew each other. Um, not easy to go back and forth across the border these days, is it? No, it takes forever. It doesn't take as long to get into Mexico, but it takes a while. And then coming back, it's, there's just lines for a mile of trucks waiting to get inspected on the way across the border. Yeah. And then there's razor wire at the border, and Nogales is the is the one border town that I've seen the most of. It was just a pretty little town, you know, sort of hilly. And now that's it's got razor wire everywhere that's trapping little animals and dangerous for children. Linda, if there was a message you could 
give to America and the world about the border? What would it be? Oh, get to know your neighbors. You might be surprised at how much you like them. It's so unfair. There are people that come and make that trip. It's so so dangerous to get. And if you come from El Salvador, my gosh, mm-hmm. it's you have to go through one, two, three countries to get here. And they're having a terrible drought. People are starving, and they're going to go someplace to survive. They want to live. They want to feed their families. You um, announced a few years ago. You'd been diagnosed with uh, progressive supranuclear palsy. Right. Uh, it's a barrel of monkeys. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry, but I think lots of people are wondering, what's it like for Linda Ronstadt to not be able to sing? Well, I used to love to knit. <laughs> I thought I would do that when I stopped singing. But that's I can't do that. I don't have the motor skills for it. I'll tell you, it's really a drag to not be able to sing when today I'm going to see Amy Lou Harris. We used to sing over the phone together, oh. you know, and we just harmonize as naturally as anything. And I can't harmonize with her. And then when I go yeah. home to my family, I can't sing at all. And that was what held us together, you know, because some people in my family were Republicans. So I, I didn't hold it against them as long as we could sing together. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I really miss singing with other people. Well, people miss you singing, but uh, we like you talking, too. So while I have the chance, everybody listening can make this recipe in your book. I'm going to do it, like, in the next few hours. El Minutos Cheese Crisps. No, no. Oh. Well, you got to have the right tortillas for that. Yeah, you have your tortillas, and then after that, you just, what do you do? Well, you grate them up. You grate up the, I use two types of cheese, Longhorn, Cheddar, and Monterey Jack cheese. Mm-hmm. And make sure you get a lot of cheese on there. And I think it's good to butter it first, lightly butter. Butter, really? Oh, my word. Yeah, I like butter than cheese. And so you, you have some... El Minutos cheese crisps and then take a nap? It's, it's not that heavy. <laughs> it's a thin coating of cheese, but it has to has to be there. Uh, what do you think of when you look at the at the sun and the mountains and the landscape of Sonora? Well, I think it's been there for a long time before I was there, and it's going to be for a long time after I'm here. So it, it's sort of humbling. I like to be able to see for long distances. I don't like being in a forest because I can't see what's coming up on me. I love the mountains. That, that's the way I can tell where I am. If I'm in places like Ohio with no mountains, I don't know how to orient myself in space. Hmm. You could stop anyone and say, I'm Linda Ronstadt. Where am I? They'd be happy to help. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Linda Ronstadt, her new book uh, with photos by Bill Steen. A collaboration from Lawrence Downs, Feels Like Home. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. There's a bittersweet hole at the center of this next interview. NPR's Scott Simon went over to celebrated chef Jacques Papon's house to talk about his new book, Art of the Chicken. And while they're cooking and chatting, we're reminded that Papon's wife of 54 years died just a couple years ago. But it sounds like he keeps her memory with him. Every time he sets the table, pours a glass of wine, and enjoys a meal. You know, the best way to do hamburger, you go to the neighbor to do it in the neighbor so you can mess up the kitchen. Jacques Pepin is the French chef who helped show America that food could be more interesting than TV dinners, jello salads, and spam. Canned meat, not the junk email. Do do we want lettuce on it, too? Well, I'm putting lettuce on mine. I have iceberg. Would you like some? Sure. Food could be fresh, seasonal flavorful, not just convenient. That's the chef with Julia Child, of course, the other French chef. We went to see Jacques Pepin, who's now 86, at his home in Connecticut. He has a new book about cooking, yes, but also his other art. The master chef sketches and paints chickens. He says his publisher said, great, we love it. Recipes too, right? I said, uh, I don't want to do recipe. I have 100, I have 30 oh, book of recipes, so... 
I decided not to do recipe, but to do more a narrative style of yeah. explaining story and recipe about eggs or chicken. His book is called Art of the Chicken. Chef Pepin believes the chicken is to France what the bald eagle is to the United States. It's been a national symbol from the time of Henri IV, an emblem of the French resistance during World War II and now the French national soccer team. Chicken from Brest, his region of France, have blue feety notes, white feathers and red combs atop their heads. The bleu blanc rouge, you know, the color of the French flag, being born in Bourg-en-Bresse, for me, the Brest, B-R-E-S-S-E, the Brest chicken, are considered one of the greatest chicken in France. Anyone who comes to Bourg would have chicken, from cold chicken in aspic to chicken with cream sauce and tarragon to pâté to sauté to whatever. I mean, the chicken was uh, it's a very democratic meat, you know. It exists from in truck stop to three-star restaurant with uh, truffle under the skin. Chef Pepin has had an event-filled life story, truck stops to four-star restaurants. His parents ran a restaurant in Bourg-en-Bresse in France where he learned about cooking, chopping, and chicken plucking. He left school and went to work as a kitchen apprentice at the age of 13. It's not like I couldn't go to school. My brother became an engineer. I just didn't want to. I wanted to go to work. He worked his way up in Paris kitchens and at 20 was drafted into the French Navy. The Navy recognized that Jacques Pepin might be better deployed at a stove than swabbing the poop deck, and soon he became personal chef to the president of La République, Charles de Gaulle. Chef Pepin served two years at the presidential palace, then told Le Grand General he was going to America. He wished me good luck and gave me a big cigar to smoke to his health. I mean, at that time, yeah. at that time, I guess, we smoked. He worked at top New York restaurants, then turned down the chance to become the White House chef to John F. Kennedy. He had already worked for a president. But then Jacques Pepin went to work for an American name just about as famous, Howard Johnson. He was in their test kitchens for 10 years and says he learned a lot. I work with two chemists and, uh, you know, learn words like uh, specific gravity or coliform or bacteria, which I didn't know anything, the writing of recipe, American eating habit, and then production, of course. Which, he said, made all his subsequent ventures possible. Chef Pepin opened a soup stand on Fifth Avenue called La Potagerie, became a food educator, began to appear on television, and then entered Julia Child, with whom he did decades of TV appearances. They met through a friend, Helen McCullough. Helen told me, oh, I have that woman from Boston here. She's coming next week. You want to cook? I said, yeah, sure. She said, uh, she's a very tall woman. She has a terrible voice. But, so and that was, of course, Julia. So we became friends in 1960. So we were friends for half a century, basically. And that, that means that we argue all the time. But we drank a lot of wine, too. So <laughs> it helps. Well, she turned to him in command. Yeah, she come out with that, Jacques, is going to pour out that turkey. I said, I am? <laughs> oh, yeah, so... Yeah, and we got many later at that point telling she was so much more French than I was, <laughs> doing stuff in the old style, saying, no, we don't do that anymore this way. So, mm. But we had a good time. I must say, a bottle of wine in Julia Child sounds like See, all the makings of a fun time. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. I got I to gotta return to the chicken. Uh -huh. I love your, your portraits of chickens, and I, I think... Somebody listening to us might be moved to ask this. You obviously love the chicken. Right. How can you cook and eat things you paint so beautifully? I have absolutely no problem there. When you are a kid and you go to a farm like I was during the war, you know, you don't mistreat the animal. No, you take care of the animal, but... Uh, when it's the time to eat a, a duck on Sunday, so you go kill the duck, pluck it too, and uh, no problem at all. It's part of life. There is no problem about consuming animal and raising animal and loving animal. I wouldn't eat my duck, though. We're sitting in your kitchen. Yes. Oh, my. Uh, I am, I'm looking across this beautiful space. Looks like a painting of a French countryside, and above the fireplace is a plaque. It mentions uh, the name of your wife, Gloria. Yeah, yeah. You were together a long time. 
She left us yeah. a couple of years ago. I'm sorry. 54 years. Yeah, I, I don't really want to talk about it. Okay. Gloria Pepin died in December 2020. Her face and photograph still smiles from every wall in every room. You, um, you say in this book that the basic test of somebody's cooking skills is to make an omelet. Yes. You want me to do one for you? I was just trying to figure out how to ask. <laughs> okay. So Jacques Pepin prepares an omelet, cracking eggs and whipping them with just a fork in a bowl and jots of pepper, salt, and chopped chives. No secret ingredient, just good ingredients, great skill, and decades of experience in this kitchen with a wall full of well-used pans and in life. So that you have it approximately smooth. These days he mostly teaches about food and cooks a lot for himself. Do you still enjoy cooking? Yes, maybe not as much as I used to. Mm -hmm. And also... When you're a young chef, you tend to add to the plate, to add more garnish, add this, that too. As you get older, you kind of eliminate more, get closer to maybe something more essential. You know, and if I'm left with a beautiful tomato from my garden, a bit of coarse salt and olive oil, I don't need more embellishments. In this big house, are you ever just cooking dinner for yourself? Yeah, this is the hardest part, actually. I still have a glass of wine. I open the, the red wine. I have a glass of rosé or white and a glass of red. I put the bread on the table and less sophisticated than my wife would have done. She would set up the table by herself, like uh, with flowers and so forth. But yeah, no, we still set up the table and sit down and enjoy a meal. Jacques Pepin, his new book with recipes and artwork, Art of the Chicken. That's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. Let us know what you think. You can write to us at bookoftheday at npr.org. I'm Andrew Limbong. The podcast is produced by Jivika Verma and Mason Tran and edited by Megan Sullivan and Taylor Burney. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. The show elements for this week were produced and edited by Samantha Balaban, Melissa Gray, Emiko Tamagawa, Jeanette Muhammad, Isabella Gomez Sarmiento, Hadil El Salchi, and Sarah Oliver. Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening. 